Hello guys, hope you are doing fine today. As I said a couple of days ago, I'm here today to reply to this pilot. He's a Emirates 747 pilot and he sent me a set of messages on Facebook and I compiled them all together and pasted on a Word document and totaled about seven pages worth of messages. So I decided to go ahead and reply to all his messages at once. So let me go ahead and get started on this. Greetings, Alan Card. I read your brief on emergency landings and as a pilot that has flown for China Airlines and has flown flight China Airlines 884 between Hong Kong and LA, I had a few questions. Would you be open to discussing these with me? Thanks. So I did reply and said, okay, let's, let's talk about it. Okay, cool. First, the 747 was able to make the trip from Santiago to Sydney 20 to 30 years ago, but it wasn't a profitable route because of the lack of passengers and the relative inefficiency of the older 747. Because of this, it was a good strategy to use a hub and spoke system for those routes. Santiago to LA was a profitable route, as was LA to Sydney. People still got to their desired destination and the airline stayed profitable. My airline uses this system for the very expensive A380. Uh, it must have over 80% of passenger capacity to be profitable, so it's used almost strictly in a hub and spoke route system. So, uh, first of all, I don't think had read my book. You know, he probably only read, saw the pictures and he's commenting on something, but the story is not nothing to do. But anyway, a lot of people have this condensing idea of South America. Brazil ranked the eighth economy of the world since I was a kid. He only lost when China became to be counted in this top 10. But before Brazil occupied eighth and Chile and you know reaching minerals and stuff like that. So South America is an attractive and full of rich people. Yeah, a lot of poor people, but uh, there are plenty of room for a weekly flight 30, 40 years ago, or perhaps as Brazil used to have until the company folded, uh, bi-weekly flights to South Africa. And then the company went broke. It's an article on Qantas when they started flying to South America from Sydney to Santiago. And it says he uh, operated by a Boeing 747. It's just one. They're one only Boeing. They flew three times a week. Let me see. From today, Qantas will offer three return service a week. The Sydney Santiago route, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, operated by a Boeing 747, has been refurbished with award winning IA380 style cabins, seats, and in flight entertainment. It's a Boeing 747 because this is not just a regular Boeing 747. I have told you guys before look at US Air Force One. It's a Boeing 747 200, but it's not just like the other ones. It can fly up to 640 miles per hour and has an autonomy much longer. It can fly all the way from DC all the way to Hong Kong, which the normal 747 200 only flies from DC to Tokyo. So they operate a special, it's not just, they, they haven't restyled just the cabins. It's a Boeing 747 and it has more autonomy. How do I know that? Because I saw the interview of a Latin mechanic explaining he was brought up to a globe defending channel. The, the idea they wanted to end the flat earth idea that we, there are special airplanes flying the route and he, he backfired because the mechanic said yes, we have special planes like the Brazilian Air Force can fly all the way from Rio to Tokyo. He said that and he, he said those lines are operated by uh, not regular 747s. Santiago is one of South America's most dynamic business center and provides excellent connections to the rest of the continent. There are strong ties between Australia and South America with growing visitor numbers, mutual investments in Australia Chile free trade agreement in place. But even back in the 70s or 80s, South America was is a rich region. Now, uh, the, what the, the doesn't know this is not a flight, a regular passenger flight. This is a charter. It was a charter flight. Okay, the Brazilian soccer, national soccer team was going to play in Sydney. I personally went to the airport. I used to work for the airline. We went there. Not just me, a couple of friends. We, sat, we saw them off 
and we were all expecting them to fly from Rio to Santiago and from Santiago to Sydney. Why? Well, let me show you here real quick. So that's the distance between Rio to Santiago. We were all expecting them to go from Rio to Santiago. From there, fly 7,000 miles to Sydney. We were all expecting that. And to our surprise, they flew 6,290 miles to uh, Los Angeles. Charter flight. And the uh, crazy thing is that from Los Angeles to Sydney, it's 7,500 miles. Completely crazy. We were all like, what's going on? That was in 1988. And we were, we didn't know. I had no, I didn't have a flat earth map to understand what was going on. Nobody knew. The Brazilian team only had a day to practice before the tournament. Took them like 20, almost 30 hours to fly. When on the ball earth, it should have been a quick flight, as even Paul said that the flight from Sydney to Santiago is 11 hours. Yeah, it should have been a quick flight from Santiago to Sydney. The Brazilian team had a, uh, had an entire week to practice, but uh, instead, they took it took them 30 hours to get there. They had to spend days on jet lag adaptation. They only had one day to practice. Going back here. This same story repeated, this, is, this was in 1988, okay? Same thing repeated in 2023. 2023, the same thing, Brazilian female, this time, soccer team, tournament in Sydney, charter flights, no more stopping in LA because back in 1988, the US did not require transit visas to Brazilians, so we could land there and go anywhere we wanted, but now, they require $180 transit visa to anybody. So the Brazilian team, they traveled with a lot of people on a charter flight and they flew from Brasilia to Tahiti this time, from Tahiti to Sydney. Why not Brasilia, Santiago, Santiago to Sydney? Okay, that was pretty crazy. And But when we look here, Brasilia to, same thing here, okay, look. They could have flown Rio to Santiago, Santiago, Sydney, 7,000 miles. Instead, they went to Rio and flew 7,500 miles to Sydney. Makes no sense. This flight, 2023, same thing. They could have flown Brasilia, Santiago, right here to Sydney. Now they had to fly to Tahiti. Understand here, when you look at the flat earth map, from Tahiti to Sydney, it took them again, like, 30 hours to get there. Let's continue the email. Now, with more people flying the route and more efficient aircraft, the route is being flown directly and takes about 11 hours. The route and length of this flight would not be possible using flat earth navigation. Pretty weird because you can be, you know, it doesn't make sense on the globe earth calculation. You know, it doesn't make any sense at all. So, second, flights from the west coast of the US and Asia or even Europe use close to Great Circle Routing. Great Circle Routing is easy as explained by taking a piece of string on a globe and connecting the destination and departure airports. This is the shortest distance between them. Hey, have you tried to lay this piece of string on a flat earth? Look, because on a globe earth is not a straight line. Difference between straight line and a curved line. Straight line is the shortest line that joins any two points it always moves in one direction. A bent line that's not straight is called a curved line. It doesn't move in one direction. Why? Because you have to be constantly moving directions. You know, straight line and then you have to adjust and adjust. This is not a straight line. This is a curved line. This is a straight line. Curved line definition explains right here. Curved lines, lines that are not straight but are bent, are called curved lines. So have you tried to Get a, take a piece of string and lie it on a flat earth map. This is the great circle route. Great circle route means the greater circle of the equator. Okay, all those related to lines are circles. The great circle line is a shortcut between them. That's all what it is. And it's a straight line, not a curved line. Third, many routes are built to take advantage of tailwinds provided by the jet streams. Jet streams are actually formed because of the global world temperature pressure difference and the Coriolis effect of rotation. Here we have 
1962, it already explained the jet streams. It's nothing new. They already used the subtropical jet stream of winter, latitude 35, speeds occasionally approaching 300 knots, mean heights 40 to 45,000 feet, westerly, three large waves in northern hemisphere. We have the polar jet streams. Now, flight planning right here. 1962. In view of the rapid fuel consumption of jets, however, wind has proved to remain a signif significant factor. Substantial time can be saved in flight planning for the common aviation system with inclusion of the upper winds in flight planning, especially during upstream flights. 1962. They already knew. They knew the speed. Right here we see 200 knots the polar jet streams, 300 knots, the subtropical jet stream. If you don't know, the subtropical jet streams are right here. Polar jet stream, polar jet stream, these two are the subtropical jet streams, 300 knots. So all you have to do, change this to a flat earth map, and you can see the route from Sydney to South America. They get on the jet stream, whether this one, 300 knots, for this one, 200, 250 knots, that's how they get here. As you may say, you yourself said, but we have these uh, documents from 1962 stating the same thing. So, Sydney to Santiago, they can either fly with the 300 knots jet stream right here, or the 250 knots jet stream, either one, and now most likely this one right here. So, jet streams are not nothing new. Whether they are formed by the rotation of the Earth, I doubt it because the Earth does not rotate. We live in a stationary Earth. Globe believers cannot provide proof that the Earth is actually traveling around the Sun. No experiment can prove Earth's movement. The observation is that we can't tell here in this room whether we are moving or not. That it is not possible to conduct any experiment to tell you whether you are moving or not. No experiment you can do. We could look at the decay of a radioactive nucleus or some electricity and magnetism or bounce a ball, have a pendulum, whatever it is. And there's no experiment you can do to tell you whether you're moving or not. And there's no experiment you can do to tell you whether you're moving or not. And that, that's led Einstein to relativity. Wow. So that, that's the, the basis of general relativity, which is our best theory of... Which is our best theory of... Because you can't measure it. Well, let's move on. So, fourth, there is something called ETOPS, Extend Twin Engine Operation. It's basically a legal requirement that states two engine airplanes must stay within a radius of time to suitable, divert air fuel, that radius is aircraft dependent and based on mostly based on redundant equipment if an engine fails. So, they say some routes in South America, they don't fly because of these, you know, especially over Antarctica. So let's look here. Uh, this is the bottom of the South America. Uh, they say they cannot fly over Antarctica because of that ETOPS. And this is the Antarctic, uh, the Antarctic Treaty, actually. Uh, but this is on the globe, right? It makes no sense. They have 59 bases, research and military bases here. I don't have all the 59 dots, but they have 59 of them here, military. You cannot even come here by boat, right? So ETOPS uh, for airplanes, how about boats? You know, you can boats cannot cross this either. Uh, it makes no sense at all. And that's why we don't have those flight routes here. They claim ETOPS is the reason for, but boats cannot even get close to here. You, If you guys follow my uh, TikTok compilations, we had an incident there where the tourists paid a lot of money for a stop here and they were not allowed to and constantly this happens you're not allowed to cross the 60th south well, what's going on in antarctica why so much secret and why do we need an international treaty to protect antarctica i'm on board norwegian star our ship is not going to antarctica they secret secretively changed the name of this cruise yesterday on the app from south america and antarctica to a round trip South America. According to the customer service desk, this decision was made by head office in Miami before we departed. 
and it was for operational reasons. They refused to explain what those operational reasons are. We know it's not weather. So what is the reason? We started uh, talking to people last night. Everyone was angry. We told people to join us here at 9.30 this morning and look at all the crowds that have turned up. Customer service are refusing to acknowledge us. They've sent their security officer out to calm us down, but we just refuse to be told, uh, sorry, we're not going and we're not going to give you reasons. We feel we're being cheated, being scammed. This is the security officer telling everyone to calm down. Now, everyone on this ship has paid a lot of money to cruise to Antarctica, not to do a round trip of South America at sea. We are being dismissed, ignored, refused answers. They're telling us we just have to accept it. Well, guess what? We've paid too much money, we're too smart, and we're too angry to just order another cocktail and sit down and accept the fact that our money has vanished into Norwegian uh, cruise line's pockets. So we've not seen or heard from the captain, interestingly, not one announcement from the captain, nothing. So we're angry, we want to be heard, we want answers, we want transparency, we want clarity. I'll tell you one thing, don't ever take a Norwegian cruise. It is, um, they are treat us, treating us with absolute disdain, disrespect. They think we're idiots. We're not idiots. And we're not prepared to just accept this sitting down. We may not get to Antarctica. The chances of this cruise now going to Antarctica are minimal. And there is more not just that. Even a flight from Troll Airfield, which can land a 767, cannot fly to Williams Airfield, which also can land a 76. Seven. So when we look at the flat earth map, it makes way more sense, it doesn't make any sense on the ball earth on this Antarctic. Hey, as the tops affect the internet, the cable lines, the ocean lines, because when we compare them here, we see that on the flat earth map explains why those cables cannot go from South America to South Africa, from South Africa uh, to uh, directly to, to Australia or from Australia directly to South America. Is this also because of ETOPS? To my understanding, this ETOPS is just an excuse for not, not being possible those flights over Antarctica because Antarctica is not a continent on the bottom of the ball earth. It's in fact this, like here, it's the Antarctic Circle just as in the past it was always called the Antarctic Circle. Uh, coincidentally, the cable lines also match the flights, okay? When we convert these flight routes here to the AE map, it looks just like the internet cables, just like nothing goes on uh, around the south. And I don't think it's about it tops, it's about because Earth is not a spinning ball. So let's go on. I was told to reach out to you by a commenter in a flat earth forum. He didn't have answers uh, to some of my questions and was insistent I do so. Please don't think I'm doing this to prove a point or be argumentative. I'm just trying to follow through with a request. Thanks for reading. Yeah, I do expect that you have a higher standard because I had pilots before, globe pilots, and I trusted their words. You know, they start initially sending me messages like you did on Facebook. And that was nice, I hosted one on my, my channel. It turned out he was working with uh, uh, Maktoum and he wanted to show the, broadcast the show to his channel. And he brought along several people and he was talking to he, that guy, Maktoum, while he was with me. And I'm by myself, I, I don't have anybody. I'm on my own. Uh, what I talk about, it's what I, the conclusions I have gotten. I don't depend on anybody to tell me. I do my own research. So I'm sorry that you had this experience. There's no excuse for that. I'm a nice guy. I have no agenda, no you will, and definitely no anger issues. It's truly really important that you shut down this discussion with blanket statement and no counterpoints. So uh, I really didn't know one to go on because I'm a busy guy, but here I am and I'm addressing your the whole seven page long message. So I would love to discuss your findings and conclusions. Your resume is good, but not as sufficient to make a conclusion on the shape of the earth. You need more situational awareness, knowledge and study. I have degrees in aeronautics and astronomics from Embry-Riddle Aeronautic University. I was a military pilot for over 26 years and a U.S. Coast Guard patrol boat uh, commander. I have flown for both Cathay, Pacific and Emirates 
aligns with ratings uh, in the 737, 747, and 777 aircraft. I've lived in the U.S., Hong Kong, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and now in Dubai. I've um, obviously navigated myself to over 100 countries all around the globe. I'm also a global sailor with a large cata cata catamaran that has sailed tens of thousands of miles around the globe. It's not my degrees that convinced me that the world is a sphere. It is my navigation of it. My degrees taught me the science behind aeronautics and astronomics, the ability to calculate orbit, space flight system, the mechanics of celestial bodies, and how to navigate on the sea, in the air, and in space. However, it's my experience that has proven the world to be a sphere, including seeing the curve with my own eyes from altitudes exceeding 40,000 40, feet. I'm probably as close to an uh, expert on global navigation as you can get, have an advanced knowledge of orbital mechanics and space makeup as well, and very open to friendly discussion. Well, has an excellent resume, but he hasn't found anything wrong on what the Portuguese did 500 years ago when they sailed all over the flat earth with just the magnetic compass, the astrolabe, the quadrant, and with these three tools, the Portuguese navigated and mapped the world. With these three tools, the compass, the astrolabe, and the quadrant, the Portuguese navigated and mapped the world. This is a 1514 Portuguese flat earth map. Up until the 13th century, the European explorers were reliant on celestial navigation. This is the practice of measuring the distance between the horizon and certain stars, the Sun, the Moon, and quite often, the North Star. In the early 1500s, Portuguese and Spanish navigators initially measured these distances with a cross staff, and then a quadrant. The quadrant is one quarter of a circle. It's usually made of brass or wood. From the top is hung a plumb bob, along the lower edge is a scale. Early mariners sighted along the edge to the celestial body reading off the lower scale, the angle that the body was above the horizon. The Portuguese in particular were quick to utilize the astrolabe and a set of astronomical tables called the ephemeris. The ephemeris worked like calendars, telling when certain stars could be seen at certain times. An astrolabe was a bronzed round disc with four holes. Sailors held it up to the sun or stars and measured their height above the horizon. This gave them their latitude as they moved east or west across the oceans. Magnetic compasses were first used in China during the 12th century and were soon seen in Europe by the 13th century. And when sailors realized the massive benefits they provided, they were used on every voyage. Sailors were able to map out their voyages more clearly. Trade routes from Europe to the Indian Ocean and down the west coast of Africa were mapped by cartographers. In the 14th and 15th centuries, Portugal's Prince Henry the Navigator was instrumental in initiating voyages across the Atlantic. Portugal was credited with another pivotal innovation, measuring ship speeds. He used a piece of wood or chip and attached a rope to it. Knots were tied at regular intervals along the rope. The chip was then thrown into the water and as the ship sailed, the number of knots that rolled out on the rope were counted using an hourglass. This number was used to calculate the ship's speed, a system still used on the water today. Not only that, they assigned the correct coordinates in each place. For example, here, when they discover Tristan da Cunha, it's an island in the South Pacific, here is the latitude 37 south, you can check today in Google, the same one today, and they did this on a flat earth map, they mapped the world. Okay, this is their map, 1514. Actually, when this was ready, they had already mapped the world, discovered many places, Fraser Island in Australia. Same coordinates. Did you know that Portuguese adventurers secretly discovered and mapped Australia 
250 years before Captain Cook. Lesson 1 in White Australian History. British explorer Captain James Cook discovered Australia in 1770. Or did he? We've known for a while that the Dutch arrived here before him, but what about the Portuguese? I have great admiration for Captain Cook because he was a fantastic skilled captain and navigator and you know his achievements in no way lessened by the fact that quite unknown to him a Portuguese fleet had sailed along the same coast in the opposite direction some two and a half centuries previously. He says the first European to discover Australia was Christopher de Mendonça who led a small Portuguese fleet in the year 1522. The original 16th century Vallard Atlas contains more than a dozen hand-drawn maps of the world. And we might just stop for a moment and look. And there indisputably is Fraser Island. You can't really deny that at all. It's when we come to this and when we then came to look at the names on the map and the geographical features that came into focus when we did this, it became absolutely clear. What European country was the first to reach Australia? If you think it was Britain with Captain Cook in 1770, or even the Dutch before that, you'd be wrong. Maritime maps dating back to the 1500s strongly suggest that Portuguese navigator Cristóvão de Mendonça sailed into Botany Bay in 1522. So if, uh, if you know, has an outstanding resume, but did he find any mistake? Uh, you know, wasn't he able to say, to come today and say, well, the Portuguese got it wrong, he, they thought Earth was flat, and they sailed, and they mapped the world, but they got the, you know, the coordinates are wrong here, um, Tristan da Cunha, Fraser Island, absolutely not. Nothing that the Portuguese did had, has been proven wrong up to this time with the so-called globe Earth math. Even there was not globe Earth math back in the 15 or 1600s. What do you mean the universe is flat? Part 2 in which we actually answer the question. The mathematics required to fully make sense on curvature was invented in the mid-1800s by George Bernhard Riemann, this guy right here. That up to there, there was no math that was performed to navigate on Earth, they had, they were relying on the, all the knowledge that came before. And then in the 1800s, they started, after all the discoveries were made, all the latitudes and longitudes were assigned, they started to convert everything into a globe. The so-called Haversine formula was invented in the 1800s as well. Our side formula, this formula was first discovered by James Andrew in 1805 because it was first used by Joseph Mendoza Rios in 1801. The term of Haversine itself was created in 1835 by Professor James Iman. So there were, after they had made all the discoveries assigned all the longitudes and latitudes, then they decided to transform everything into a globe Earth. The proof is right here with Mapa Urbano Monte. You can check out the coordinates were already here. They had already mapped the world. Here you go, the latitudes and the longitudes right here. And if you go to the equator, you're going to see the same thing that you will find when looking at the voyages of the Russian explorer and then Captain Cook, Peterton. See here, you, they had 360 degrees. Even up to the last Russian trip around the world, you know, around the Antarctica wall, his first report, it all had the coordinates in 360 degrees. And it was in the 1800s, actually in 1850, they, they divided in two between 180 and 180, when they had already changed everything to globe math and globe projection. But everything before that, 1500, 1600, 1400s, all flat earth map, all the coordinates, all the stars position, same thing that had been used for, for centuries, it's still used today. So Eddie, thank you.
Because you responded kindly, I'm going to give you quite a bit of my time responding back to you. I did watch Flatten the Curve and Beyond the Curve. Now, I, as I said, I did not request anything, you know, except I just asked a question, did you watch this movie? I didn't ask him if he watched Beyond the Curve, because I have not watched this movie uh, myself. But I was interested if he had watched Flatten the Curve. So first I have a relationship with God. So don't take that, don't take what I'm about to say as blasphemy. We have to disregard scripture or other religious reference in this discussion. We agree that the Bible was written by man and translated into a language we can understand. Well, yes, it was written by man, but the Bible, it's pretty clear. Our scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be truthfully equipped for every good work. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. God speaks in ways a human can't understand. Metaphors are commonly used for us to express what we believe. God's telling us through our hearts and minds. Okay, so God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. God saw it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So, I don't think this is a metaphor. And that's a big problem here for the heliocentric model, because according to the heliocentric model, there was a big bang. And we know here that earth was created first, the sun came, later, the fourth day. And according to the heliocentric model, there was this big explosion, the sun came first, earth came later. So this is a direct contradiction to the word of God. So I'm not with you on this one at all. That's you. I don't know what God you serve, I'm sorry to say that, but not the God of the Bible. You know, there's a clear difference between what you uh, believe. You believe in a limited God, that is out of creation, and that's not what I believe. And let me just finish reading this. We also agree that if a human from 2000 years ago or even 300 years ago were to see the world as it exists today, they would not understand even the simplistic of things like plastic or styrofoam. Let alone pictures, TVs, cars and airplanes. The entire world would feel like an alien planet and we would be seen as gods. Humans used to think rain was caused by gods, the sun was a god, and even fire was a god. Science has been able to explain many of these things and would also help us humans understand the world they were seeing in today's world. Uh, without the, that being considered, science is the only way to discuss the makeup of the earth intelligently. I hope you agree. So, I don't agree because science lies a lot. Science is not here to tell us the truth. Science is a way of power. And let's think about science and the scientific community. I think that none of them has truth as their chief value. I think the chief value of science is power, and science is mainly about gaining power, gaining power over the world. They use truth to some extent on the way to achieving power, but this is not say, their say highest a bit value. More about I think science as an institution is interested in gaining the power, the, to gain control over the world. It all comes down to money in, in many cases. Uh, in order to have an institution, if you're a freelance scientist, you just explore the truth, okay. But as an institution, at the university, you, you, need, re you need money to finance. You, you, so you submit, a research, you, you, you submit a research grant and you have to convince the authority not of the truth, you have to convince the authorities that what you want to do will somehow make us more powerful, will somehow enable us to produce a new weapon. Mm -hmm. And this is really what gets the money. I mean, the first breakthrough scientific discipline that launched the scientific revolution, according to my understanding, was geography. It was all these sailors and all these explorers living Europe in the 14th and 15th century and exploring the world and mapping it. This is the first big scientific um, project to map the world. 
the big thing was geography and was exploring the world. This is where the big money went to. And the reason the big money went there is because the kings of Spain and Portugal and France and so forth and the bankers in Genoa and Venice, they thought that mapping the world was the first step to conquering it. A few scriptures here. The Bible is a flattered book. Isaiah 40, 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Psalm 104.5, he set the earth on its foundation so that it should not never be moved, or it does not move across the universe. Revelation, after this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, the four winds, the polar jet stream, the first uh, tropical jet stream, the second tropical jet stream, and the third and the fourth polar jet streams around Antarctica. So that's, that's what it is right here. So the people 2,000 years ago, they knew what they were writing because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know how any other way to say it, and I'm, I'm not trying to be harsh here, but th there are a lot of pretenders uh, who, who talk about, you know, cuneiform texts and ancient languages and stuff like that, and they don't know any of it. They never took it. They never studied it. They wouldn't know the first thing about it. They couldn't give you the alphabet for any of it, but yet they're the experts. Well, you know, I like to say I, I am what these people pretend to be. Okay, this is my area. And so I say that. <laughs> you, know, you shouldn't be lying to people. Uh, you shouldn't be making stuff up. It not only deceives people, but it dishonors the, the ancient people that produce this material. And uh, they, they wrote not to be misunderstood, not to be a tool of manipulation, but because they had certain things they wanted to communicate. So, I do not know what God are you referring to, but definitely the God that you serve is not the God of the Bible. And uh, if you want to tell me more about that God that you serve, that you believe, uh, this is not a blasphemy or anything, I just would like to know the your God is limited. He cannot do much at all. You know, I, the, my, the God that I believe does not contra contradict himself. Everything is there within the scriptures and it's there for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training. Second Timothy 3, 16, 17 tells us. So let's go ahead, second, flatten the curve. Not one of the pilots was a global pilot. They flew popular aircrafts, business jets or helicopters. Their experience of global navigation is either very limited or non-existent. The seaman was very limited in his experience, watching a screen or watching missiles hit targets absolutely does not make you intelligent in the makeup of the earth or the way navigation works. The merchant seaman was obviously junior and he doesn't have a firm grasp on compass mechanics at all. He also didn't understand atmospheric effects over long distance. The avionics tech has zero experience in navigation. His insistence on gyros, always finding level is simplistic at best. I'll explain further later. The submariner was not a navigator or officer on board. He had no big picture awareness of global navigation or how a periscope works. I'll explain this and the laser gyro later as well. As a patrol boat commander and global sailor on my own boat, my experience and knowledge far outweighs the merchant marina. So, first of all, we were all given uh, only eight minutes in that documentary. The, the uh, director gave us eight minutes. They say, well, you have eight minutes and just try to, you know, say whatever you can in eight minutes. So, to judge these guys based on eight minutes of their time they gave to the documentary, it's pretty foolish, okay? And of course, you put yourself uh, above them all, and uh, let's let's go. On. As a global pilot flying 747, 777 all over the world, my flight experience far outweighs any of the pilots or aviators. As a Navy commander and pilot with top secret clearance, my experience and knowledge of weapons, radar, global navigation are much more extensive than the Navy seamen 
and the avionics tech has very limited knowledge of anything to do with global navigation. So I consider all of this source inappropriate to, to intelligently discuss global navigation. So again, you know, you have a great resume, but you cannot find any mistakes on what the navigators did 500 years ago. What you say is like, okay, none of those guys are capable of telling whether the world is flat or not. You've got to have to have your experience, your degrees. So nobody had it that before, right? And they were claiming Earth was a ball just by looking at a ship uh, three miles away. You know, I mean, I don't know if you're helping the case here. Let's get started. I'm going to use words like opinion or ridiculous. Everything I'm going to talk about will be explained as easily and as logically as I can using reference to math, science, experience and critical thinking. Let's start with your flight from to forms uh, Santiago to LA to Sydney. I explained earlier about the hub and the spoke system of airline routing. So I'm not going to go over this again because I just did. He thinks that this is a regular flight. When I told they explained this uh, fl uh, charter flights could easily have flown to Santiago and then to Sydney. The second one the same thing but there are specific aircrafts for those flights on the flat earth map. That's why Brazil had, when I worked for the company, 747-200, 747-300, even the 400. But it was not the plane equipped or modified to make that flight. That's why Qantas has one specific that flies that fly two or three times a week. So you gotta have an, a specific aircraft that flies that route. It's not, you cannot just take the one that did Sao Paulo to New York and fly the route, even though it was at 747-200. But you cannot just take that, okay, okay, let's do it. It's not, it's a different airplane. Uh, for those, uh, okay, so now with more passengers flying the route and more efficient and, more efficient and smaller to engine aircraft like the 787 and the a350. That route is flown directly and does not go anywhere near LA. The route turns south before we're heading back not to the destination. I greatly encourage you guys to watch this video by Jaron. It's, um, it's quite old. Max Eager, he was not a flat earther. He criticized a lot and he was about to prove flat earth was wrong when he took the flight from Santiago to Sydney and his compass that gave a reading that supports the flat earth. So, uh, northwest, west and southwest. That was his compass. And he was comparing the compass uh, on the plane, the digital one and on the front back seat. He was showing a different re reading. I saw an interesting video that Jaron did on the Jaronism YouTube channel regarding a flight that Max Egan took from Santiago to Sydney. So as we look at the great circle route that you would take going from uh, Chile, Santiago, Chile, across the Pacific Ocean all the way to Sydney, Australia. You would take this route, which is uh, exactly as he said. You would start out first going uh, south or southwest, and then you would take a little portion of it going west, and then you would go northwest. So that would be the lineup. I was looking at the compass. And their compass at one particular point was reading northwest, and my compass was reading west southwest. And my compass stayed reading west southwest for the entire journey. Well, the entire journey that I was awake anyway. So, just to kind of show what he was saying, he said every time he checked his compass, he was getting a southwest reading, which a flat earth would show. And on the on screen video display on the back seat of the uh, seat in front of him, uh, was showing a northwest as the globe would show. He had been asleep for five hours, he said, but when he woke up, the plane was showing the portion of the trip as northwest, but his compass was showing a different reading of southwest. His compass remained in the southwest position for the entire remainder of his flight. But I was asleep for five hours during the journey, but every time I checked my compass, it was pointing south-southwest, and I find that a bit strange that I would be flying south-southwest all the way from Santiago to Sydney. It didn't really make a lot of sense to me. So, but I took the well, compass. Really I, took I, mean, the the, 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 I took a little video of the compass on the screen, and I compared it with my compass sitting on the table, pointing directly straight ahead to the nose of the plane, 
and I was getting a different reading. So that's something that might interest you. Well, that's amazing, Max. I mean, if you look at the Gleason's map, if you were traveling, you would be going west-southwest the entire way. So, I mean, those are the kind of things that are important because they are not possible on a globe. And so these are the kind of things when you say it's not provable, you just kind of proved it, that something is wrong. No, I, didn't prove, I didn't prove anything. What I offered you was uh, an interesting piece of information. Right. Should be put My, okay. Right. right. Well, and for people out there that are saying, what are you saying this for, Max? Would you like, can you turn my screen on? Would you like me to share that particular video with you? I would love it. Here you are, folks. I've been asleep for about five hours. There yep. you go. We got it. Now, as you can see, So here we can clearly see that the plane is in the portion of the flight that it's turning northwest as seen by the on-screen display. Here's the problem. That's the reading that I'm getting from the radar. So as we can see here, as he said, in the radar or on the on-screen display, uh, clearly the plane is traveling northwest according to the flight tracker. So, as you can see, the compass is clearly showing southwest or west southwest, and the on screen display is showing it is going northwest. Something is clearly weird about that particular flight, which seems to show northwest as the intended path of the flight, yet uh, Max clearly showed uh, at least that portion of the flight was showing southwest on his compass and he claims that it showed southwest the entire time he was awake. Uh, let me show you a flat earth map so you can get an idea of why that's a big deal. Now let me look at the flight as it would take place here on the Gleason's map. Uh, you can see the black line being the flight's path if it were on a flat earth and if you look at the lines that have the green on them uh, those are lines where the plane would be flying northwest. The line with the purple would be flying about west. And then all the yellow lines would be flying southwest. So the interesting thing there is when Max said that the second half of his trip, the entire time he was awake, his compass was showing southwest. That would make sense with all the yellow lines, as you see. Uh, remember, north is relative to where you're at with south behind you. So that's what those little pink lines show us. And as you can see, all the yellow lines are actually a southwest flight direction. Uh, where on a globe he should have been going northwest. Right now, and for those who said today nowadays they say, oh no, you need a compass for the south, calibrated, made in Australia. I don't think the Portuguese imported an, a compass from Australia, New Zealand, from from the Maoris. So they could go and discover their land and map and assign the coordinates. So this is how 1800s Bowworth conversion stuff it has nothing to do, you know, with the truth. But as I said, and as you saw in the video, the science, science is not about truth, it's about dominion, but it's about power, domination. Flat Earth map and Great Circle Route are fairly similar in the Northern Hemisphere. I can see why Flat Earthers, if I may call Flat Earthers, use this as a verification of their model because so many people lived and traveled in the North Hemisphere and very few ancient and lived in South Hemisphere. Actually, quite a lot of people live there, okay, in the South Hemisphere. It's just that the geography, as you see in the Flat Earth map, is not possible to be flying from, you know, f South America to Africa, from Africa, from South America to Australia. It's all, you know, just look at the cable lines, not possible to, lie, to lay the cables over the ocean. 
Uh, even the boats cannot navigate there it, due to the fact that the Earth is not a spinning ball. Global Earth navigation, or even knowledge, was not something many people concerned themselves with. The landscape is quickly changing, however. Now that more people are living in the southern hemisphere, in places like Sydney, Cape Town, Santiago, Rio, Johannesburg, and they are flying to more places, global navigation is becoming more mainstream. The simple fact that the flight routes in the southern hemisphere do not work on a flat Earth map, but absolutely work using global navigation is proof enough of a spheric, spherical world, it would be to any skeptical science. So let's look here at these flights. Distant neighbors' lack of flights makes travel more expensive and makes interaction between Brazil and Africa difficult. So difficult for Brazilians, and 40% of Brazilians are descended from Africans, and so hard to travel from South America to Africa. I wonder why. Let's look here. All right, so this is a flight from Argentina to India, which has to stop in Amsterdam. So not a country here, not impossible to fly. And when we look on the flat earth map, we can understand why the hubs are created in places like this. It's because from there, they can go from other to other places. On the ball earth, be much easier as a hub here in Africa. But it doesn't really make sense because this is not the layout of the world. Here on the flat earth map, it makes no sense a uh, hub here. It makes sense on the center because from here you go to the other place. Same thing here, we talked about this a couple uh, weeks ago. Uh, these guys, they went to Cape Town thinking that from there they could just fly to the ceremonial South Pole. Not possible, they had to fly back to London, fly to Rio, Right, Santiago, and then go to the ceremonial North Pole. Looking here, it would be impossible to fly from Cape Town to the South Pole. They had to fly back to London, Rio, Santiago, you know, the zigzag here, because the ball is not the layout of the world. It's on the, like the flat earth map. Flights from Santiago to Johannesburg, it has to stop in Senegal. When we look here on the flat earth map, it makes more sense. Flights from Buenos Aires, Johannesburg, they have to stop in Amsterdam. Looking at the flight map, it makes more sense. The flight back from Qatar to Buenos Aires, they had to make a stop in Rome for refueling. And when we look here on the flat map, you can understand why they did that. On the globe, they could have refueled anywhere. And I've heard so many excuses here, you know, oh, they can't, there are no airports. Oh, yeah, there are plenty of airports in Africa. You can land us, you know, 777-747. It's just that's not on the route between Qatar and Buenos Aires. If we were, the Earth was a globe, yeah, it would make sense, but it, since it's not, they wouldn't stop here. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Just one more flight here. There was a flight from Tel Aviv to Sao Paulo. Same thing happened here. They could just have a shortcut directly or make one stop in Africa to Sao Paulo. No, they stopped in Madrid and refueling here to Sao Paulo. Okay, so let's go back here. And another flight, uh, it says here, the simple fact the flight routes in the Northern Hemisphere do not work on a flat Earth map. But absolutely work using global navigation is proof enough it's very covered. Uh, not so much. And we did contact first that guy, Kelsey. He, uh, he said that we could contact his airline and he would fly from Buenos Aires to Perth. And we did contact, actually, we have all the communication to another company and we tried to fly from Buenos Aires to Perth according to. You know, Kelsey said, oh, it's possible on the globe. Okay, we tried. And when they gave us the estimate and the flight route, the flight route had a stop in South Africa, which on the Google Maps, which a lot of people criticize me for using it, it makes perfect sense because uh, they had to stop South Africa. What happened to the flight? Oh, it tops. Oh, yeah, of course. Or maybe because the Earth is flat and the only way uh, we have the jet streams coming this direction here from west to east so the only way they can fly from Buenos Aires to Perth is to have a stop in South Africa and to Perth as you see here and circumnavigation is to west west to east done millions of times circumnavigation north to south done zero times so I don't think uh, this you know 
add it right. So let's go back here. Let's dig, uh, but let's dig much, much deeper. Radar. It's true. Radar work works with line of sight. So it's true. Radar works with line of sight. In flatten the curve, why did they not explain why a powerful radar with line of sight capability at sea level does not see large objects over a hundred nautical miles away? So thank you. You just admitted that we can see large objects up to 100 nautical miles away. On the globe Earth, that would be impossible. Radar works with line of sight up to 100 nautical miles away. Thank you for confirming flat Earth. Because on the globe, a boat would not, cannot be seen, you know, beyond 6 miles. If someone is right here, they say, oh, the boat disappeared in 4 or 5 miles, 3 miles, and another one behind him which is uh, completely ridiculous. On the globe model, a boat disappears three miles in front of you and another one three miles behind you. Thank you. You just confirmed flat earth because if you can see a large boat, uh, a ship, 100 nautical miles away, that proves flat earth because on the ball earth, six miles the most the boat should disappear. So thank you for confirming flat earth. Aircraft like the E-2C Hawkeye or E-3 Sentry were designed with a big rotating radar dish so they could see over the horizon Earth's curve with increasing altitude. Now, this has nothing to do with curvature of the Earth. Look at here. You see these grids? This guy, that's his eye of sight. He can see up to here. A, a taller guy can see a little bit further. Another taller guy can be can see even further. This guy number four can see much further, and the higher you go, much farther you see. It has nothing to do with the curvature of the earth. A guy on the first floor of the building there in Dubai where you live on the first floor, that's his line of sight. But if you go up all the way to the top floor, you can see much further. So it has nothing to do with curvature of the earth. When I was a kid, I was a little boy, sitting in the back of the class, I could not see my teacher. Guess what? When I stood up, I could see my teacher. Was my classroom a ball? Was I seeing over the curvature of the classroom? No, it has nothing to do with curvature of the earth. The higher you go, the farther you can see. It has nothing to do with the curvature of the earth. So if the plane can see higher, because it increases its altitude, it can see farther on the plane. It's not, it's not looking anything over the Earth's curvature of the Earth. Pretty simple, this stuff here. So, let me see. By looking closely, you can see the range are very limited by seeing objects only in a tight circle around the center. Some of the other shots were using sensor fusion. Simple seaman with a secret clearance would not understand the complexity of the image he was seeing the ship's command control center, Mr. Tag is much more simple. First, if you are on a train or airplane. Now, on is a preposition we use for train, meaning when you can stand up inside that vehicle, you use a preposition on. If you cannot stand up, you use in, for example, in a car. But since you can stand up, you can use the preposition on. So here refers to being inside a train or an airplane. So when you are inside a train or an airplane, can you throw a ball to your friend far away in the cabin? Of course you can. Can a bee land on different seats in the same aircraft or train? Of course it can. How is this possible on a train moving 100 miles per hour or an airplane moving 600 miles per hour? Because the environment is moving with a train or aircraft. The atmosphere is held to earth by gravity and is rotating with it. Now, first of all, you are comparing being inside the fuselage, you know, protected by the fuselage and thick glass and hydraulic doors to being outside in the open. As I go to uh, the beach or in camping at night, you know, bonfire, and you compare that to being inside the train and saying it's the same thing. Can I be laying on different seats in the same aircraft or train? Can I be sit, come from here and go to the front seat? I don't think so. This is, this is reality. In the open, just like here. When I go outside, I see the sky, I get wet if it rains. Look at these guys. That's only 70 miles per hour. You cannot compare 
or traveling through space in open to being inside the train or an airplane. Can you throw a ball from the back seat to the front seat and the guy catch? Probably not. That's only 70 miles per hour. Now imagine you should know about Aloha Airlines Flight 243. It exploded in midair, like decompressed, and a couple of people were flown out because of decompression. Dec decompr decompression. But still, even when the captain took another hour to be able to land the aircraft, another person was lost just because of the wind. So can the B go from this seat to this while this plane was flying 300 knots per hour? Can you throw a ball from here to here? No. So this is reality, it's the open. You cannot compare containment to being in the open like this and say it's the same thing. So this is a pretty disturbing example, you know, coming from a pilot. You know what it is to be compressed, you know, uh, inside an airplane to be on the beach or, you know, anywhere. You cannot compare those two things. You know, this is like mind control. It's like Professor Dave did uh, use that and other people like this guy, um, you know, on um, TikTok. Have you ever flown in an airplane, by chance? You can call it a closed system. We don't feel any exterior forces, okay? We don't feel the spin, we don't feel the orbit. No matter how fast it's orbiting, we do not feel it. Oh, I get it. I totally get it now. Earth is traveling through space inside a giant pressurized airplane. So, missile planes, even bullets, fly through this atmosphere to hit their targets or destination. The missile, missile, just like an aircraft, uses grid coordinates to plot a course and then just flies that point using a computer track GPS. Works by knowing your location now, then constantly updating your location. By knowing your location now and in the past, it can calculate your speed in the direction. It then compares this information to the desired waypoint and still. Well, you know, this is, we all know it works on the flat earth, right? It doesn't have, it works perfectly on the flat earth. I'm not even going to be reading this. But uh, now it, now a bit about the Coriolis effect and why airplanes or missiles, for that matter, don't have to account for it. Wind is the biggest factor in determining courses and speeds in aeronautical navigation. Yeah, because earth is stationary. All you have to worry is about the wind. Now, I can go back to that. I can demonstrate back in the 50s when they were calculating for winds and flying dead reckoning. They never accounted for curvature of the earth. They never adjust for curvature, but they adjust for the winds. So, for landing on the north to southwest or west facing runaway, again, let's go to the B on the train. No, because you're using uh, something that has nothing to do with reality. Uh, are you assuming or are you saying that Earth is traveling through space inside a giant pressurized airplane? You know, that's what you're comparing. Uh, and again, because the environment or air mass is moving with the train, the bee can't feel the movement of the train, blah, blah, blah. So, sorry about that. This example that you're giving to us is not reality, okay? We are not inside an uh, enclosed system according to, you know, the globe model. Impossible, as we, as you probably saw in my example, the atmosphere is fluid and gas, and those particles are not attached to each other. So they do claim that the atmosphere is Velcro to the spin of the Earth, right? Just like this illustration shows. But I have a big problem with that. Let's look at this example here real quick. So we know the atmosphere is the particles, the air particles are independent from each other. Look at this girl jumping on this pool filled with those plastic balls okay, that kids normally blink, play with that. If she had jumped on to a swimming pool, the liquid parts, you would see the ripples going to all directions. Okay, everyone would feel it. Uh, if she had jumped on a solid surface, you would 
see every, uh, the vibration would go everywhere. But look at this animation. The the outer parts it's not affected by her jump jump because she jumped on a pool filled with balls that are independent from each other, they are not attached to each other. That's how the atmosphere is. The gas particles are not solid, so they are not attached to each other. So to say that the airplane is flying and the backwards because of the atmosphere which is tied or velcro to earth, it makes no sense at all. And also you keep bringing the example of a bee inside an airplane on a totally artificial environment because an airplane is pressurized with a thick layer of uh, fuselage. And another example here for you, this guy on an airplane, and I don't think this airplane is going faster than let's say 150 knots per hour because that guy would not be able to do even that. But do you think a bee can uh, would the bee be, be able to fly from one seat to the other? Would you be able to sit in the back to throw anything in the front? Or if you throw anything in the air, would, do you think it's going to fall back in your hands? Of course not. So you see how the guy now is according to what you claim. The Earth is just traveling through space and there is nothing on top of him. So this is close to reality if you want to give us an example. But don't bring some artificial environment to compare with the open air. I go outside, I get wet, I get a sunburn inside a train or a, an airplane. That's not just not possible. So let me continue this. Uh, it's been an hour of video and over four hours editing. So let's get to this. Let's get the submarine guy out of the way. Navigation in a submarine around the globe is almost exactly the same as global aircraft navigation. So I have or will cover that aspect. Without knowing the height of a periscope mast, the distance it can see is irrelevant. Periscope masts can be higher than 50 feet. Combine that with the height of the submarine sail plus and then add deck height. And you could have a very tall mast with a periscope affixed that can see a very long way on a curved earth. Alright, so call uh, back in Second World War, the Japanese sank American ships and they had their periscope out of the water two feet and the American ship was 10 miles away. Right? Impossible on the globe because according to the, you can only see about 1.5 miles. Right, so it's impossible for the periscope to see and sink a ship 10 miles away. You insist that somehow, you know, those objects can see over the curve instead of just seeing farther because the higher you go, you can see farther. You know, you don't need to be on a power to do that. As I gave you an example, if I stand up, I can see, if I go to a concert, I can see anybody. Uh, like it happened to me when I was younger, my girlfriend just climbed on my shoulder and she was able to see the singer but before she was not able to. You know, things are pretty easy to understand. You don't need to use complicated math or avionics. You know, some things are pretty simple to understand. He never states the height of the man, mast, so any distance he quotes is irrelevant, but let's talk about la his la laser gyro. And we'll combine that with the avionics text discussion about rotating gyros as well. I've flown aircraft with the absolute simplest of gyros, that you had to gauge every so often because they would process so badly. All the way to the 777 Aduro system, which used the same ring lasers as shown in the video, but uses three plus accelerators and their data information. Okay, so I'm not gonna go too much farther on this. What I'm gonna tell you guys, uh, it's the following, okay? Uh, both the Aduro or the laser gyro, or what they call the IRS system, the inertial reference system. Thing, all these things are based in celestial navigation. Nothing to do about the rotation of the Earth, as you may see here in this video. Using ancient man's concept that the Earth is stationary, we imagine the celestial bodies on the celestial sphere to rotate from east to west. Over the years, astronomers have selected 57 easily identifiable stars on the celestial sphere for navigational purposes. 
the rest can be disregarded. In addition, navigators have traditionally used the planets Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the Earth's moon, and the sun. Polaris, or the North Star, is approximately at the celestial North Pole, and the rest of the sphere appears to revolve around it. Every celestial body has a point on the Earth directly below it. This is called the geographic position, or GP, of the celestial body. Sometimes it is called the subpoint. You are at that body's GP when it is directly overhead at your zenith. Remember, stars appear to move. However, they do not change their position relative to one another. So even though the celestial sphere appears to be moving, the prime hour circle and the hour circles of the stars maintain constant relative positions. So the sidereal hour angles, as well as the declinations of the various stars, are considered fixed. Using ancient man's concept that the Earth is stationary, we imagine the celestial bodies on the celestial sphere to rotate from east to west. So in celestial navigation, you got, uh, we don't consider rotation of the Earth. You go back to what they call the ancient people, which is the, the reality, okay? Earth is stationary with the stars moving from east to west. All right, so what did they do? Uh, they pretty much, the new system, all those new systems, they calculate, see here he said, the other system needed to be caged every so often and they would reset, process due to the friction on the Earth's rotation. Newer systems use the impeded aircraft position computers to calculate the Earth's rotation and the gate process. So they don't calculate the Earth's rotation. What they do, since they consider Earth to be stationary, is to calculate the movement of the stars. So that's why when an airplane, before taking off at the airport, the pilot has to uh, calibrate uh, an hour, sometimes two hours before the flight. They calibrate, they get all that information, the position of the stars. And that's how the, the laser gyro works and the ADRO works and the IRS system works. It's just uh, they get the data from, you know, the rotation of the stars, the moon, or they use all the celestial bodies. And, and GPS is nothing but the geographical point. The GP in celestial navigation, they added another S system. So GP is the geographical position of a celestial body on Earth. And they now, since we all have a, a geographical position on Earth, they apply the same concept, you know, to the, to the regular GPS. So this is the same thing, okay? Uh, modern aircraft have computer-aided system that take into account the simple formula for their rotation. Now, the, this system take into account the simple formula of the rotation of the skies. It's all based in celestial navigation. You see here, this is a Boeing 747-200, and when they first came out, they used to have a navigator there getting the position of the stars, and that's how they navigated. So I, I encourage you to look at the patent of this this system here. They created in 1974 up to 1995, uh, just before they released the GPS system, the modern GPS system. So what is this, you know? Well, this is a navigational system, and it's called Universal Planisphere Complete Guidance and Computer System. So if you look at the patent, they used another patent, you know, and you Go ahead and try to find. You see they have a pan in there. This is the Gleason's map. So why did they include the Gleason's map, a flat earth map, in this invention? Well, because it's reliable. They know that the position of the star will be, uh, they will have a geographical position anywhere here. So they use it, this because it's reliable. The flat earth map is reliable. Okay, it was used in this invention for navigation and use in celestial navigation. So, uh, we, uh, you, thanks for the story you told. Here, I'm not gonna read. Uh, so, as again, uh, the guys only had eight minutes in flattening the curve. For you who are watching this, I encourage you to watch Hervé Riboni, uh, his video on the compass and uh, how they use, you know, deviation and, uh, all that stuff to hide the flat earth. 
right? Everything was transformed back in the 1800s. And if you guys know the story of several ships that they went over to the sea thinking Earth was a globe and got lost because they were not compensating and they just got lost. So they now they have this compensation, the, you know, you have to compensate, you know, they, they call, but th there was always one compass and, you know, they came up with an artificial. True North is all about man-made stuff, it's not the natural thing that the Creator gave us. So this is all about that, right? the different color variations, it's extremely important to take this into account in navigation. Deviations are not the aeromagnetic force given off by large metals objects near the compass. These arrows must also be guided to magnetic compass. You must take all of these arrows into account in order to get the proper heading off of the magnetic compass. If you don't, you can get way off course over a long time. Yeah, you have to adapt from flat earth to ball earth, so you need to make those corrections. Again, this is about the guy, the submarine guy, but uh, as I said, you know, the back in Second World War, the Japanese sank American ships eight, nine miles away with the periscope out only two feet, uh, two feet high, impossible on a globe Earth. So I've seen roads out in the desert disappear just a mile in front of me due to atmospheric conditions. I feel you, because uh, people thought that boats, you know, disappearing of the ocean was due to the curvature of the Earth. Uh, let me see what else. Uh, you talk about the sand vanishing. Ah, okay, you're talking about the parallel. Uh, let's see a large black building through a telescope 300 nautical miles away from the deck of a ship. You never will. Sun rays being parallel. This one is also simple. Railroad tracks are parallel. I think you agree. In the distance, but they are all parallel just like the sun rays you see coming through clouds. So here, there's a difference. The train tracks will never meet each other, but the sun rays all go into one single uh, source, the sun. The parallel conversion at a far off place, the sun. This concept of vanishing point is being used very selectively by flat earthers. Parallel lines have a vanishing point, like railroad tracks or the sun's rays. So as I said, the sun as a single source, you know, it's a different from the railroad, railroad tracks. But it's not where something vanishes when it's moving in a straight line. That all depends on your eyesight and the size of the object. I can see a mountain from a great distance, but I can't see a human on that mountain. Does that mean the human vanished? No, it's just too small to see. And seeing him will depend on your eyesight or if you are using a magnifying device. So actually they may disappear because if you remove the mountain you won't be able to see the man anyway. You know, even with the mountain there or not, if he is 300 miles, not so miles away, you're not going to be able to see him. So once the sun vanishes, you should be able to bring it back into view using a telescope or binocular. You can't, okay? So what you don't understand is this thing right here. When the sun sets, it's not 300 nautical miles away that you'll be able to bring it back. If you're here in Africa, it's like 4,000 miles away. According to the flat earth map right here, 5,700 miles away. So you're not going to bring, bring that back. You think it's 300 nautical miles away from you, the sun setting right there. The sun is over here. You're not going to bring back the interview. No way, once it's gone that distance, it's gone. You're not going to bring it back. Uh, I think that's enough for now. I hope you appreciate that this took hours. Yes, uh, it has taken hours for me to make this video as well because it's not only recording. I have to edit, you know, combine audio with uh, the screen. So it, it took me, so far, it took me like f almost four hours. I watched the film and made my analysis every single thing in that film. It was debated. I hope you respect the time I put in and formulate a good response. I appreciate an intelligent debate. So this is my response. Again, you know, if you're here in the sun setting over here, you're not going to be able to bring it back 3,000 miles away. No way. So I will also end with this. Nothing I've discussed your opinion. It's all either experienced by me or easily proven scientifically. You can go out and experience everything I have for yourself. Go to a radar station and ask to see how it works. Go to the flight deck and before the flight to Sydney and ask about the flight plan. 
Well, uh, Quant has released a flight plan before they now got a flight from New York to Sydney. Pretty weird. They had to fly north of Hawaii. And that's what I have been saying. There are flights coming from Australia go north of Hawaii in reality. Of course, uh, Flight Radar 24 is going to show here because next day, Qantas released his flight plan. They flew a totally different route. Why? Because the flight, uh, the flight radar and all those websites that track flight paths, they convert, you know, the, from flat plane to above Earth. So this was in the night before, and next day they, after they arrived there, flight radar showed the path coming from here, right? But, you know, this is pretty much the reality right here. Yeah, okay, so if you don't do things for yourself and just watch videos, you will never know the actual truth for yourself. They say the same thing in Flatten the Curve. Guess what? I have it and now proved to me the Earth was round and proved to me it absolutely could not be flat. Both are important. Thanks for getting this far. Cheers. So basically, as I, went, uh, I said before, it's all based on what you believe. Okay, you believe in gravity. I would like to know if you could explain to me is this gravity, is gravity right here, or is this gravity right here, or would it be this one, or this one, is this gravity? There is a little bit more after I uploaded this video, sent me another message, and he wrote me a response. Well made video. Let me explain a few things you mentioned backwards a lot. Backwards to what reference exactly? I'm sure you've seen or can understand the following example. You are on a fast train that's running along near a highway. The cars that are going in the same dire same direction as you are slower. To you, they look like they are going backward. Are they? If you see a rowboat in a fast river trying to go upstream, but the river is faster than the boat can go, is the boat going backward? All right, so the whole thing here is a philosophical concept. You know, this is not, since Earth can, Earth movement cannot be proven, has never been proven and cannot be proven, there's no proof that Earth is traveling anywhere. Everything points to a stationary Earth. Everything else is just, trust me, bro. Okay, trust me, bro, we are moving through space because there is no real evidence of it. So uh, this is all about, trust me, bro, we are moving through space. Now, let's get more technical. For an airplane to fly, it needs to go forward through the air. The air mass that is flying within can be moving in any direction wind. It doesn't matter. It just needs air to go over the wings and achieve lift. So this is thing here. People think that there are no winds on flat earth. This is new school and you see the wind direction, all that stuff, which makes no sense. When we look at the same thing on the flat earth, you understand how everything works. So that's why they removed this projection from this website. They used to have a flat earth projection here, newschool.net. They removed, now we have to access this one here to see those are data from NOAA and all makes more sense on the flat earth makes no sense on a ball earth going back to the May you mentioned the atmosphere is velcro to a rotating earth that's an interesting way to put it which but sure I'll explain how that happens when you are standing near a fast moving train you feel wind why the train is pushing and pulling the air atmosphere along with it due to friction the same thing happens with the earth's rotation and the atmosphere gravity is pulling down on the air and holding the atmosphere to the surface of the earth so didn't get the memo that gravity doesn't pull anything at all it's been debunked over a hundred years ago and i don't think got the memo so let me refresh his memory or maybe he never heard of this gravity does not pull then here comes einstein asking a different question and that is, what is the nature and origin of gravity? Einstein said that gravity is nothing but the byproduct of curved space. So, why am I sitting in this chair? A normal person would say, I'm sitting in this chair because gravity pulls me to the ground. But Einstein said, no, 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 no. There's no such thing as gravitational pull. The Earth has curved the space over my head, 
and around my body. So space is pushing me into my chair. So to summarize Einstein's theory, gravity does not pull. Space pushes. Atmosphere. Atmosphere? Atmosphere. Yeah. So do you believe the sphere-shaped air is something we experience? Why don't you explain to me what you perceive it to be? It's your word. You said atmosphere. What do you think that means? That is the amount of gases that are held within the Earth by gravity. Held? Gravity doesn't hold anything. It's not a force. There's no scientific evidence oh, really? of gravity. Really? Gravity is not a force to hold gas in a sphere shape. Gravity is the bending of a conceptual medium known as pseudo-Ramonian force space-time derived in the mind's eye of Einstein in mathematics. It's a fourth dimensional geometry. Meanwhile, in reality, we live in a three dimensional Euclidean reality. There is no dimension of time to bend. Even if we could bend time as a dimension in a Euclidean four space geometry, it wouldn't be a container for gas. Gas isn't held by pseudo-Ramonian force space time bending in an Einsteinian gravitational dimension. Further to that, the notion that gas being held, i.e. gravity is a force, was debunked by Einstein 108 years ago. Mass does not attract mass, that's a Newtonian concept of gas. Pressure being held because of its weight going down towards the centre of Earth. That was superseded 108 years ago by Einstein when he developed the fourth dimensional space-time bending, which is not a force and is definitely not a container to hold gas in a sphere shape. So your oxymoron sphere-shaped air is merely a begging the question fallacy to allow you to describe atmospheric conditions as based on an R value, a sphere value, the radius of Earth being the value that derives your refraction rate at 7 over 6 of the radius in sphere-shaped air. Atmo, air, sphere, a shape. Air doesn't take the shape of the sphere, it takes the shape of its containment. If the gas was in a sky vacuum, we'd have none to breathe. We'd all be dead. This gas fills space. Gravity's not a force. Bending fourth dimensional space time doesn't hold it in a container. So gravity is a cornerstone. Without gravity, all of his explanation, all these seven pages, it's meaningless, be nothing. So the rotation of the Earth is pulling and pushing the atmosphere along with it because the vacuum of space is surrounding the Earth. There's nothing to resist the atmosphere from being pulled and pushed around by the Earth. Yeah, this is all, trust me bro, okay, trust me bro, science. Effects of the solar wind. The wind speed of a devastating Category 5 hurricane can top over 150 miles per hour, or 241 kilometers per hour. Now imagine another kind of wind with an average speed of 0.87 million miles per hour, or 1.4 million kilometers per hour. Welcome to the wind that begins in our sun and doesn't stop until after it reaches the edge of the heliosphere, the solar wind. Now, now imagine, imagine another, another kind, kind of wind, wind with an average, average speed of 0 0.87 million, million miles per hour, per hour or 1.4 million, million kilometers per hour. Per hour. Welcome, Welcome to the wind, wind that begins in our sun, sun and doesn't and stop doesn't until after it reaches, it reaches the edge of the heliosphere, the solar wind. This assumes you to believe in gravity. No, gra no, I don't believe in gravity. It's all about density and buoyancy. You see gravity being debunked in this experiment. Right. He has two vials of alcohol filled to the top. He weighed it and one he heated for 15 minutes and the other one he put in the fridge, fridge for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, he inserted both vials in, a, uh, in alcohol, just like what it's contained inside the vials. So the heated one floated. The one that was in the fridge, fridge sank, went to the bottom. So the heated one, which had more energy, floated. The one that had less energy sank. So it has nothing to do with gravity. How about this embryo? He won't sink into Mercury. No matter how hard he tries, it's just it's not going to sink. The iron anvil floats because Mercury has a density nearly twice that of iron. 
In fact, uh, due to the density ratios, the iron actually floats better than wood does in water. So the cornerstone of the whole thing for seven pages long email is his belief in gravity. So as I told you in the beginning, it's all it all comes down to what you believe. Without gravity, house of cards come down. So this assumes you do believe in gravity. If not, I can explain that to you. It also assumes you believe in space. I hope you do. No, I don't. Space is water. But I can explain that some as well. To your point, an aircraft landing perpendicular onto the rotation of the Earth. Think about being a train car. Again, are two examples that are totally different from each other. Land, landing on an, an airport when it's raining, windy, and be inside, contain inside an artificial environment where, you know, wind doesn't affect you or rain doesn't affect you. It's totally two different environments. So, you know, try, you can do it better. So, can it be landing any direction to see it? So, you know, it goes back to the same thing we explained before. And uh, winds are actually created by the rotation of the earth itself. No, they are not. That's again, that's an, that's how you fail right here. You remove the Bible from the equation and you try to explain things that cannot be proven. If earth cannot be proven to be rotating, it's just, trust me bro, science. You come and then build something on top of that belief. It's belief upon belief. It's no, no science here. It's just belief. So to end this presentation today, and my response to I want to ask you since you have brought gravity, it's the center point, it's the cornerstone of the whole set of your belief. Is this gravity right here? Is this is this gravity? How big is gravity? If this is gravity, if the core of the earth is, is gravity, how big is gravity? According to Google, core has a radius of about two thousand four hundred and eighty five kilometers or two thousand 165 miles. Planet Earth is older than the core. Planet Earth is older than gravity. So how did the planet Earth came about without gravity? What's the gravity's diameter? It's around six, 760 miles in diameter. This article, it's a peer review publication. Earth's in a core, a mixture of solid iron and liquid like light element. Chinese Academy of Science headquarters. The inner core is formed and grows due to the solidification of liquid iron at the inner core boundary. The inner core is less dense than the pure iron. And some light elements are believed to be present in the inner core. The inner core of the Earth is not a normal solid, but is composed of a solid iron subplots in a liquid-like element, which is also known as a superionic state. The liquid-like light elements are highly diffused in an iron sublattes under inner core conditions. Alright, so is this gravity? How about the magnetism? How can this molten core, you know, it's gravity, it's magnetism, but it's only 760 miles long, you know, in diameter, 2000 miles in circumference. If you divide it by 3, so is this how it is? One third is liquid iron, another third is light, and this one third here is gravity, combined with magnetism. I mean, just explain this stuff to us, you know, and just trust me, bro, this is not science, you know, explain that. So you're welcome to come to my show. I have a show twice a month, 75 minutes long. It's pretty time consuming for me to be replying to this messages I get a lot of messages every day and to edit this video it's gonna take me probably five hours to put everything together I want to know more about you know where what where what's di the diameter of gravity and the uh, circumference of gravity how it works here also I want to know a little bit about the God you believe because it's definitely not the God of the Bible everything else you discuss is pretty much trust me bro Earth is moving, there's no evidence, but, you know, that's that's what to believe. Alright guys, so that's all for today, thanks for being here, sorry it turn, turned out to be a very long video, but I wanted to address also some of, most of the points that made. Thanks everyone, I hope I'll see you the next time, take care, bye bye.
Don't waste any more time. Visit the links above now and order my book 16 Emergency Landings Proving Flat Earth. Visit my online store now and order the new enhanced Gleason's Flat Earth map. This map used to be in every school and library in the nation before NASA was created in 1958, when the maps were ordered removed. Have your Gleason's map hanging on the wall in your house, where no government can take it down. Here you see it hanging on a wall in the house of the late Charles K. Johnson. Here is a quote from the book 1984 by George Orwell. Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book rewritten. Every picture has been repainted. Every statue and street building has been renamed. Every date has been altered. And the process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Order your map now.